You're listening to Inside the Circle. Coming up in this week's show. If the best memes goes in volume of scent, then George Power would definitely be up there. But the quality of them uh, is questionable. Uh, well, Olympics is the dream, like I say, it's the biggest thing. We kind of never expected it to go wrong as, uh, uh, you know, as it did. Um, he likes to pick them what some of the most awkward moments come and stick his phone in my face and pretend that we're best mates. Um, if you could describe it, if you bottle up that feeling of just how you feel when you're singing the national anthem just before the international game, you'd, I heard one, one of my former teammates describe it when he retired, if you could bottle that feeling and sell it, you'd, he'd be an extremely rich man. And all I heard was my dad turning around, would you get off me? Because I could see him at the bar Pulling my dad's trouser legs up and saying, Come on, Andy, would you give me a feel of those calves? While it may be a difficult time for us all at the moment, we at GB Hockey are here to try and help put a smile on your faces with our latest episode of Inside the Circle, the podcast. My name is Will Moulton, and today I am joined by Mark Leghorn, a man who has played more than 150 times for England and Great Britain, appeared at two World Cups and one Olympics scored nearly 50 international goals and has been described as having some of the biggest calves in the game of hockey. Uh, more on that later, but first of all, uh, welcome to the show, Mark, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Will. Hi, um, hello to everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to, to be part of the, the podcast and uh, yeah, it's interesting to see what we go to today. <laughs> um, so I guess, first of all, we are nearly three weeks into to lock down in this country, how have you been finding it, and, and what have you been up to over the last uh, sort of two and a half, three weeks? Yeah, it's um, been a bit of a weird time, um, exchange time. Uh, to be honest, like not too bad. Um, we uh, we we've got plenty to do in regards to as much uh, training as we possibly can. So we always have a couple of sessions a day, um, six days out of seven. Um, so. Usually try to keep a bit of a uh, routine uh, every day and try and get my training done in the morning. That usually takes me up until about lunchtime. The conditioning session and then like a kind of a, a home circuit type thing. So that keeps me busy in the morning and then just doing plenty of jobs around the house and just chilling out and spend a bit of time with, uh, with my wife and uh, the dog. and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I can't even play in and quite enjoyable, to be honest, at the moment. Uh, however, um, if that goes on, we'll see how, how long it goes on for and see if I, I continue to enjoy it for, uh, for a few more weeks or not. Yeah, that was going to be my question. Um, how is it, how's your wife finding it that you're spending a lot more time at home than, than you would have been? Is she enjoying it or is uh, or are you winding her up a little bit? Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, my wife's a personal trainer, so usually whenever I have them, we, we don't see each other that much because she works very unsociable hours, but early mornings or, or late at night. Um, so it was it was nice um, to be uh, to spend a lot more, more time together. But like I said, I, I think she's uh, really ready to kill me now. <laughs> it's been too much time with me, particularly whenever she's trying to do. Uh, whether that be online learning or some 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 sessions or self online, and I'm getting in the way and annoying her. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know how much longer that lasts. Uh, so uh, we'll see. So you said you mentioned there about your, your training and, and keeping that with the routine. But have you find that you're actually you've started doing other things that you wouldn't have had had time to do previously, like stuff around the house or a bit of online learning or something like that? Or is it still you you're actually quite busy? Yeah, well, um, to be honest, like at the start, we were actually really, really busy because at that point, the Olympics were still going ahead uh, this summer. Um, so we were training really hard and had lots and lots of sessions to try and do to kind of keep us ticking over. Um, but obviously, when the announcement of the, the Olympics being postponed until next summer uh, came about, then it, uh, it calmed down a little bit. Um, I think everyone relaxed a little bit more. We obviously had a bit more time uh, to prepare us. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's quite nice. So, kind of get my training done during the mornings and then actually have a little bit of time uh, without being absolutely shattered. So, uh, 
New Zealand come back from Bisham absolutely shattered, so I don't want to take too much. But now I have a bit of time to do a little bit and pieces around the house. Um, over the past few years, a couple of years, me and my wife have been renovating our house. We're almost finished, so uh, just trying to do the last two bits and pieces and a bit of touching up here and there. So uh, it is quite nice to have the time. Um, it's also nice the past week, the weather's been a bit nicer, so can get out in the garden and stuff and do a training a bit outside. Um, so still still being outside a little bit, but obviously in our own property. So um, yeah, it's, the, it's, it's just, just a weird time. Um, I wouldn't really be one who, who goes out for coffee. I don't think coffee or tea anyway. So um, kind of uh, that, that part of life doesn't really bother me too much. But uh, I know some of the other guys are getting a bit uh, antsy as they're um, being locked up all the time. And, uh, as I said, my wife spent on 24 7 with me. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, interesting. You mentioned though about how the guys are getting a bit antsy, maybe not being able to meet up for coffee. How are you as a team sort of managing to interact with each other and what sort of things are you, are you doing just to, to keep in touch with each other, basically? Well, we have a couple of WhatsApp groups. Um, so we have a WhatsApp group with all the staff on it as well. So, uh, you know, usually something daily goes on that. We have a bit of a weekly challenge that goes on. Um, for some of the lads will maybe set out a challenge for the boys uh, to do. Um, well, I'll be physical, well, I'll be skills challenges. Um, let's say we have our training to do, and our SNC coaches have kind of set up a, a kind of a leaderboard thing for that. So that keeps us entertained. And we also have the players group WhatsApp. Um, so, uh, yes, a lot of good memes going on, a lot of good uh, uh, bit of banter. You know, a few of us kind of just fire around the odd sports question about the old classic who am I football over question things like that there um, which keeps us entertained so yes still speak to the guys every day so um, I'll, always always in touch with them so who's the funniest uh, who shares the best memes uh, <laughs> uh, well George if, 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 if the best memes goes in volume of sent then George Penner would definitely be up there but the quality of them uh, is questionable um I know, to be honest, everyone can contrib contributes. Um, yeah, and, and to be honest, none, none of them are original. They're all just recycled from somewhere else. So, um, you know, Will Callan has uh, potential to uh, come up with the old cracker. But, uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's just a good laugh. We'll come on to your relationship with Will Callan a bit later because uh, it's quite famous how you two get on on Instagram. Um, but you mentioned there going back a, a few minutes uh, about the Olympics being cancelled and I guess when it was announced it was a decision we all knew was coming but how did it, it feel and how did you sort of react when you, you heard the news that we have to wait another year at least? Yeah, it's um, a strange one. Um, obviously it's the right decision uh, but for someone who's coming, who's a bit older um, it wasn't maybe a decision I was hoping for. Um, but you know it's absolutely the right decision, and it just it's just one of those things that you, you can't control. Um, so to be honest, I haven't really thought about it too much. Just try and track on and train as hard as I can. For the moment, it's it's it's, it's thrown up quite a few questions. Uh, that uh, at the moment we, we can't really have the answers for. It's, it's understandable. It's a quite a unique situation we're in. Uh, with regards to well, when is it going to fit this this lockdown going to finish? When will we get back training as a team? What's going to happen with pro league? All the other games? What's going to happen with well, pretty much most of the guys had kind of sorted out what they were going to do next year uh, or after the Olympics had finished. Well, I was going to play abroad. Well, I was finishing playing, getting a proper job. Um, you know, so it's thrown up a, a lot of a lot of questions and not many answers to be honest um, right now. But uh, we're confident that those answers will come, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and you know, but uh, you know, we'll we'll just we'll just like I said, we'll just kind of crack on doing what we can um, at home here, and then whenever we come back together and see what the program, you know, training and games looks like. Uh, 
it is what it is, unfortunately. I guess for you it must be quite frustrating as well, given that you'd started off the year, you come back into the team having missed a lot of 2019 through injury, you played three of the four games in Australia and New Zealand, the, the team were, were getting some momentum going. I guess obviously health, the health of everyone outweighs the current situation, but for you, given the momentum that you'd started to pick up, it must have been that, this must be that bit more frustrating now that you've had to, to stop again. Yeah, really frustrating. Um, but like I said, it's not really much you can do. So it isn't as that it's, uh, you know, not worry, not, not as if we do get too head up in regards to thinking about it too much because everything's completely out of control. Uh, we were just about to go to South Africa before the, the lockdown uh, was announced and um, that got cancelled. Um, and it was just, just just a very strange time. It was, it was a very strange time as well, trying to train. Before the full lockdown down came on board, you know, with only small groups of players, and, you know, trying to book in your time and to go into the gym and stuff, which we usually don't have to do. Um, it, as a team, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty... Pretty frustrating because, like you said, we been away in an Australian New Zealand trip. Um, it was a long, long trip, uh, but it was a really good trip. Um, we tweaked a few things and how we were going to play and uh, what we were doing in the press and like that, things like that. There, and I was I was really excited about how we were how we were looking, and how how we were progressing our play, and um, yeah, and just. Said it was just the uh, buckets. So, like I said, well, it's one of those things you, you have absolutely no control, and everyone's health is uh, much more important than any hockey, any hockey tournament, or any hockey game, or any hockey training session. And so, yes, we as a team kind of have our plans, and the, 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 the management were absolutely great in regards to get my information as early as possible. To Keeping us in the loop about what was happening, so that took out a lot of the um, the unknown for for us, and you know, kind of the worry about what was happening. Um, yeah, and so we just we just we were just able to get on with that pretty easy. And you mentioned there about how how excited you were about where this this team is going and the progress you've made. I guess th this team has pulled off some impressive results and put in some really good performances over the last year. And you know, where where do you think this team is, and what? What do you think you can achieve over the next eighteen months or so? Uh, well, it's always it's always difficult one to answer what you what you think you can achieve, but uh, the ultimate goal has to be you know winning the Olympics. Um, I think you said we as a team probably for a number of years we we can show that we can compete with any team in the world. Um, it's just really the consistency of that. Um, and that was something that we we've been working on and, and, and trying to execute them under under pressure um, because um, at the Olympic Games is it brings a lot a lot of pressure. Um, well, probably well internally and externally. Um, I'm just trying to best how to deal with that. Um, I we were trained for the conditions in Tokyo. Uh, it was going to be extremely hot, um, extremely humid. Um, I'm just kind of like I said that was part of the excitement that I felt that we were in a really good position you know, for what the management and the staff were doing behind the scenes to prepare us, um, to help prepare us, you know, physically and mentally and um, hockey wise. The, the goal, like I said, we were, I think we were in a bit of an upward curve. Um, by far, that will take us, only time will tell. You, you got to absolutely, literally, absolutely maximum you can. And, when on the goals, you know, you've seen in any sport, things don't obviously go to seedings or world rankings. Um, and that's why sport is sport, and that's why we love it because it doesn't go to script. Um, we have to just have to, that's why we always have to be in for the most ultimate target, and that will be a gold medal. And for you personally, then. I know we'd spoken before the trip about how excited and looking forward you were to, to going on the tour. How did it feel to 
to pull on the Great Britain shirt then for the first time in in over a year and and you know the the culmination of a, a long year of, of hard work for yourself. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's I can't really describe it really. Um, if you could describe it, and if you could bottle up that feeling of just how you feel when you're singing the national anthem just before the international game, you heard one one of my former teammates describe it when he retired. If you could bottle that feeling and sell it, you'd he'd be an extremely rich man. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's it's obviously. You're know, always extremely proud to play for um, Great Britain um, any t- at any time. Um, it was really nice to. It, it's, it's weird whenever you're because you're, you're still part of the squads, um, but whenever you're out injured or away from the team, you're always a little bit separate. Um, just simply because you're not involved and you're not playing, and, and uh, there's, not, there's, more, there's only so much training you can do without actually ever playing, and that that, that was that was a real struggle. And just being part of the team and uh, felt really really good. And we're obviously together with ambition uh, most of the time, but I missed a lot of last year. Um, I'm with the first year of the Pro League last year. The guys were away a lot, so. Um, you know, it always feels a little bit different and you don't feel quite as part of the team and that's what's so good about back playing and, you know, you feel you're involved in everything and, and just that pride and um, excitement about playing for your country is, uh, is it's, 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 it's a bit like a drug, really. It's it's a pretty hard, it's it's hard, extremely hard work to get there and that's why you do all the training the games and I obviously haven't played a game for a long long time so uh, and I've done a lot a lot of training um, uh, so yeah just just a part of relief as well um, but you know just happy to be playing I, I love playing at the national hockey as it's it has plenty of downs as well um, but uh, like I said that feeling just before you're about to play is just nothing else compares to it Hi, I'm Mark Leghorn, and you're listening to Inside the Circle. We're back, and it's time for part two of our podcast with Mark Gleghorn. And now it's time to find out a little bit more about the man himself. So uh, a fact that maybe not many of us listening to this podcast will have known, but Mark was actually a very, very talented cricketer back in his youth, played alongside a, a number of players who since went on to represent Ireland in the sport of cricket, and I think you won the under seventeen, two thousand European Championships. Is that right? Uh, I don't know what year it was, but yes, kind of won under, well, won a few tournaments playing under age cricket, uh, Europeans, but certainly won a couple under fifteen and one under seventeen. And I became a, I started another year at under seventeen to play, but uh, it came to a point where. I had to almost I had to choose pretty much between hockey and cricket. Um, when I started playing in the national representative with both levels, uh, it was it was much easier because it, it was traditionally the hockey season you finished Easter and you're in under age on the national tournaments at Easter holidays, and then I was able to play cricket during the summer. Um, but it was my first year under seventeen that the, the hockey then became the all the national tournaments in the summer. So I did go sports for that one year. Um, I actually won the Hungarian Team European Championships in Rotterdam with Ireland. Um, I went straight to play at that under 17 European um, cricket. I won that too. Uh, so I won two European Championships uh, within the space of two and a half weeks um, with different sports. So it was pretty good. but. That kind of t- started to take its toll, um, uh, trying to balance its two whenever it became both all year round. Uh, sports, we, we, like I said, I tried to do it for the first year, did it for the first year, but it became really tough and it became quite apparent that I had to, to pick between the two. And, uh, yeah, and I ended up doing hockey. Did your sort of family history with, with hockey have any influence in your decision, or was it? Was it more of a case of you pick the sport you preferred? No, uh, I pretty much just picked the sport I preferred. Um, it was the, uh, it was a tough decision 
some people thought I was bad at hockey, some people thought I was better at cricket. Um, but I just didn't pick them, but pick them the game I enjoyed the most. Uh, that's why I done quite many sporting sporting life to be honest, because when I was younger I played all sports. Football, rugby, cricket, the golf. Um, well, that was mainly my dad trying to make me play golf. Uh, I wasn't really that interested. And I look back massively with regrets on that there. I wish I played much more golf when I was younger. Um, and was, uh, I suppose that the cricket that I got to the point where we started to play three, four day games. So I was almost going from one extreme to the other where hockey is such a fast and you play four games in four days compared to one game over four days. Um, but yeah, and I just, just pretty much picked up what I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the most. And, uh, it wasn't an easy decision. My parents left it. Um, obviously, I had some discussions with them, but they were happy enough to do whatever I wanted to do. So, um, yeah. When you look back at and you see the success that the Irish cricket team have had over the last few years, and do you ever think I wish I'd have been a part of that, or are you you pretty happy with the way that everything's panned out for you? Um, no, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Uh, I I think it's right. Uh, like I know how tough it is uh, at the top level sport. I think it's unless you're there. Realize how tough it actually is. Um, so any time I'm watching sport, um, you know, as much as I enjoy watching the all sport, I'm not particularly cricket. Uh, uh, there's always the, the, the thought in the back of my head is, you know, it's it's it's, it's not just what you see at that moment in time. It's uh, the time we play. We play a lot of, of uh, hockey, and we're away a lot. We're the hockey players. Or so I hate even more. Um, so no, I just uh, and like I said, I picked the enjoyment, and I think by almost obsessive you need to be to, at the top level. Uh, you don't enjoy it; it's going to be even more difficult. Uh, so I think whenever you think about it, and how I say how I, I think I always did prepare the hockey over the over the cricket when I actually got down to think, really think hard about it. Um, you know, if you don't pick for the right reasons, it's going to be pretty difficult in whenever it comes down to it. So I, I'm happy. One thing I've I've noticed though, and, and I'm sure people on social media would have noticed, is that when you guys are away, you do end up playing a lot of one hand one bounce and a lot of cricket as well. Um, who are the who are the the best players in the team, and, and who are the players that maybe try and shy away from it a bit? Um, uh, was probably with regards to that well obviously one hand one bounce in the corridor of cricket is very different than proper cricket um but um i'm sure it's no surprise for a lot of people to hear that when he was playing by middleton was one of the best uh he just seemed to be able to turn his hand and move the but anything he does in a sporting context uh so barry was always, always absolutely brilliant uh once again, George probably, George Panner will probably tell you he's the best, uh, but I was a long way from it. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, but it's, it's all good good fun. Um, and we, we, you know, some of the staff get involved the other time, you know, analysis and, and things like that there. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's not taken too seriously, so we don't get, well, we do get competitive over it, uh, but it's, it's all about fun. And who in the team is most likely to start up a game of one hand, one bounce, or corridor cricket? I was always Barry. Barry was always the guy who forced when he was back when he was there. Uh, my own first sight is always he can't sit still. Um, so he's always wanted to do something, uh, well, it's cricket, well, or it's uh, a game of football. Um, you know, we play lots of different sports, whether it's game cards or something. He's, he's always wanted to do something. So, uh, He's probably taken over that mantle. Um, and Brendan Creed, to be honest, there's an old one who can't sit still. So, um, yeah, probably between the two of them nowadays. So, so going back to you, you made the, the decision to play hockey over cricket and you, you represented Ireland 80 times at a senior level and then 
came a, a move that when you and Ian Lewis at a very similar time made the transition uh, to come and play for England and Great Britain. I was just wondering if I could ask of how that came about and, and sort of what your, your thinking was at the time and, and how tough a decision that was for you. Yeah, um, that came about right in 2008. We failed to qualify for the Beijing Olympics with Ireland. Um, and uh, it, was, it wasn't it was actually something that I had, had thought about too much. Um, but after 2008, uh, I actually had an operation on my left shoulder. And so I was out of the game for a lot, long time, for almost a year. Um, and actually, with that time, this kind of time out of the game kind of got thinking, and uh, I can't really remember how I came around about really, but it was something that I kind of thought I, at that point, I had I'd been in England because I was studied at Loughborough University, um, so I played in the Premiership for three years. And I kind of thought I could, felt that I had the potential to play. For, for Great Britain and a good job, um, a good job. And so, and it's my goal, I've always said what I said earlier on, that's, you know, you've got to aim for the absolute utmost, which was always an Olympic gold medal. Um, for me, the Olympics is the biggest, the biggest thing in our sports. Um, and that was something that I had always, playing hockey, I'd, I'd thought about and um, dreamt about as a youngster. And, Thought my my best option, our best best avenue of doing that would be through Beth for Great Britain. Um, I I always knew hockey in Ireland was on the rise. We had some exceptional results um, at underage level then for Ireland. Um, but then senior hockey and on underage hockey is, is very different and. Uh, it wasn't an easy decision. It took me a long. I changed my mind quite a few times, uh, but like I always, ultimately came down to what was my best opportunity for one. I don't really thought that was planned for for, for Great Britain. Um, but it was. It's interesting. Like uh, at me and Lurzy ended up doing it at the same time, but that was a completely separate decision. Like we didn't. We never talked about it together. We never. Had that conversation um, until we had. Uh, it was almost like we definitely decided, but at the same time, and he was one of my best friends from Bath Island, and so I, I, so I, uh, I, t- I told him uh, what I was doing. Uh, he was like, "Well, oh, I, I didn't see him, so uh, I kind of, uh, kind of, you know, I said, well, we did it together. It was very separate, and we never talked about that." So. So yeah, it was uh, it was wasn't an easy decision, um, but one that I, I felt that I had to make. You made your you made your Great Britain debut in in late twenty eleven, and I believe you you scored in that game as well. Um, I guess how did it how did it feel to be pulling on the the Great Britain shirt for the for the first time? Yeah, it was it was really really good, and I have to say that you know I I don't feel any. Uh, I was always extremely proud playing for Ireland um, on many underage teams. So in that regard, it didn't feel any different. Um, I suppose one thing that probably was also I never meant, I didn't mention there previously was that when I was growing up as a youngster, all the best the best players in Northern Ireland played for Ireland and Group Britain. Um, and it was after the maybe two Olympics that they changed that. So um, so my aunt, my two, I had two aunties who actually played um, for Ireland and Great Britain, and one of them won bronze medal in the Nike Two Olympics with the ladies team. Um, so kind of growing up, I was always brought up with the the, the ultimate was always playing for Great Britain. We played for Ireland, and you know if you were good enough, then you played for Great Britain too. Um, so probably you know being brought up and kind of that with that thoughts, you know, I'll see me to that, that, mm-hmm. that decision as well. Um, it was a night debut against Belgium and they scored there was, yeah a lot of uh, relief, mm-hmm. a lot of enjoyment, um, a lot of frustration as well because 
so I had to take three years out of international hockey. And as tends to be with me, I got injured in that three years. So that three years nearly almost became four years. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't a case of just taking a break for three or four years. You know, you still had to do all the training. And, uh, and you know, we got to a point where we were able to play on, on cap games for, for England or for Britain. But they're always a little bit different than that. So proper cap international games. So it was a long time coming. Um, you know, and that was that was brilliant to actually finally finally get the play for Griffin and then the score was extra uh, special. One one of the things about switching for playing for England and Great Britain means that you've actually come up and played against Ireland a few times since. How is is that for you? Is that something that you sort of you've got used to now, or is it something that you still find a bit a bit strange? Um, it's it's no, it's something I've got a bit more used to. At the start, it was very very strange, um, and particularly, you know, I was also when I left, I still still managed to keep some of my friends, and you know, uh, you know, so like I'm, I'm like I had my brother he played for Ireland. Maggie Watt and John Jackson, who I went to school with as well. Uh, you know, so the four of us went to school together. Um, so, you know, that those friendships kind of were, were bigger um, than the decision for me to go, go abroad, as much as they didn't, didn't agree with my decision. You know, I kept very, I still have good friends um, who play for Ireland. Uh, so that was difficult. Uh, just strange, obviously, with the decision. Didn't go down some well in some, some areas. And uh, adds a bit more pressure to the game as well. Uh, at the start, it was very difficult, and um, and then obviously there's a difference. Like some of the, the actual tournaments, the games were really important at times. Um, so that became uh, had an extra um, uh, edge to them as well. Um, as I said, it's 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 a strange one because. I want my brother and my friends to do as well as they possibly can. But whenever we're competing against them, I want I want to make sure I uh, we win, because um, you know that's how it is. And um, that's also strange because I want hockey back home. Well, I want hockey everywhere to be, you know, to do as best as they can. And the more success I think Irish hockey has. The more it's it become probably a bit more mainstream back home, and um, the more kids playing it, uh, and the more uh, media attention that hockey both here and back home in Ireland has, the better for the sport. Um, so you know, I wanted them to do very well, but not at the expense of, of us. Uh, so it's 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 weird because, like I said, playing against the brawler. I said, uh, is, is it a, is a strange experience because the competitive instinct is to not care, but then it's my brother, so I do care. Um, but like over time, the part of the novelty has worn off, and um, over time, that the Irish team and all that, you know, that so the guys who I used to play with, or a lot of them are no longer about because they've retired or moved on. Uh, so I don't know as many of the Irish players nowadays uh, than I, I, I used to when I started playing for England and Great Britain. Uh, but I love Ireland and England and Ireland, or Ireland and Great Britain will have, always have a bit of space to it. Um, but like I said, it's a bit more used to it now. And you mentioned they're playing against your brother, which must be a, a weird experience. And and I guess what's it like in the days leading up to a game between the two of you? Will, will you talk or will you try not to talk? And then what's it actually like there? Out on the pitch, is he is he a bit of a pain in the bum? <laughs> uh, no, we will still we'll still talk. We whenever we talk most days, to be honest, you know. Um, whenever we're at tournaments, we tend to actually meet up and then have a have a good get together because apart from Christmas time, we never really back home, um, so I don't actually get to see him that much. Uh, so it's always nice whenever we're at tournaments to, to catch up and get what. We'll, we'll still talk, but on the day of the game, we don't talk to each other. Uh, so that's always a, a, a kind of 
it just in a specific way. Well, we never actually ever said to each other that that would be the case, uh, but we just don't do it because, like I said, the competitive instinct <laughs> kind of takes over with regards to that. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, on the pitch, we are both fairly competitive. Neither, well, like on game day, we we don't we don't acknowledge each other at all, really. Um, and all on the pitch, it's no different compared to anybody else. Um, you know, sometimes there's a few words exchanged, um, but again, that doesn't really depend. That's not because he's my brother. That doesn't uh, that happens any any game. Uh, really, and to be honest, the, the game's too so fast. Because <laughs> um, if you're spending any time having a conversation or, or you know, a best legend or whatever, you know, and, and looking out for uh, making sure it's my brother, then the game bypasses you. Um, or, or else I'm trying to catch my breath, to be honest. Um, but uh, like I said, that, that doesn't, uh, there are a few issues um, at some time. And, uh, you know, in 2015 at the Europeans, yeah, 2015, we were playing each other in the bronze medal game, which Aaron beat us in, but before the game, he was struggling. Um, uh, so, you know, with an injury, and uh, he wouldn't tell me what the injury was because he thought I would take a cheap shot at him in the game, um, which is fair enough. I wouldn't expect him to tell me an injury, but then when my wife, my wife found out about us, she gave us a bit of a grill on and said we had a real go at us because she was like angry, really angry and she couldn't believe that two brothers wouldn't speak to each other because one was worried about what the other would do to if he knew what injury he had. So um you know it's it's kind of like but we we, we as brothers we, we wouldn't expect any difference. Uh, and so we wouldn't expect any different compared to you know if it was competing for whatever and 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 how do you do your families find it given that you're playing for two different countries do they find it sort of slightly weird when they're watching the two of you play against each other or is again have they have they got used to that um i think i don't know dad always would wear if we were playing against each other would always wear one both one of both or both of our shirts, so one over the top of the other. Um, apart from that, we never really had the conversation with him well the family. Uh, certainly, my wife uh, has, has told me uh, quite a number of times that she would always support Ireland over uh, England or Great Britain. Uh, so, uh, no, but she did say that if we did play each other in the Olympics, that was that would pose a bit of a tougher tougher dilemma for her but uh i certainly know where my, my wife's uh, loyalties lie um and it's not on my side uh but you know dad i think dad has always kind of said he doesn't really care he wins as long as we both have good games and um you know well we can kind of with both of our histories don't go near of us get injured so uh, as long as that happens he's happy enough i think that's a perfect place to end the second part of this podcast uh, we'll be back after this very short break You can subscribe to Inside the Circle from all good podcast providers. So now it's time to answer your questions that you set in for Mark Gleghorn. We've got 10 of them this week. We'll start off with quite a, quite a nice one. Uh, what's the best goal that you've ever scored? Um... I can think of two goals, um, and two for very different reasons. Um, and I'll start with probably the international goal, and that was um, a goal against Germany in the bronze medal game to 2017 Europeans. I think 2017. And, um, so it was kind of, uh, yeah, ball over the top. Brendan chucked an aerial TMZ and for some for some reason we had managed to switch each other's positions. I was really deep and Namesy found himself really high up the pitch. But Brown shot an aerial to him and I was in our own half and sprinted. It was just a really a foot race between me and the man. Um played the ball across and it was a full length diving. 
Um, I heard to score a goal, probably out of the back post, the first 3 2 up. And then we managed to finish the game off to 4 2. Um, we managed to set out the game to win the bronze medal. So that was probably my best goal internationally. Um, but probably the best goal I've ever scored. I think that comes to mind was whenever I was playing underage representative for Ulster under 16s and um, as in our inter provincials that probably get this wrong but in my head I, I had the ball in the circle and I was quite probably a few yards off the baseline and I looked up this across the ball I noticed the goalkeeper off his line a little bit and I kind of thought I might as well hit it and I did hit it and it went on the roof of the net so um, yeah kind of I think that's probably been my best my best goal ever, but probably no one ever remembers that apart from myself. As long as you remember it, that's all that matters. Uh, something that we would, we've would we been talking about a, a bit earlier, but if you weren't uh, a full-time hockey player, what career would you have liked to have had? Well, I, what I'd like to have had was a professional footballer's career. Um, um, you know, I played all sports when I was younger. I said earlier, hockey, rugby, cricket, the golf. Football, football was obviously when I was really young and growing up then was obviously the number one sport and played a lot of football. Um, love football, still love football today. But today um, so that would definitely be it. Playing for Manchester United, I had big man kind of fans. So playing for Manchester United would be, would be an absolute dream. That is also one good thing about self isolation or lockdown and sport on. So, all the reruns, and I can now watch football when United were good <laughs> back in the day. So, um, yeah, no, that would have been brilliant. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, this is a question from fellow GB hockey player Shona McCallan. Do you love your dog or hockey more? Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, Different loves, probably. Um, the love of hockey has been for a long, long time, ever since I was a child. Um, and obviously, I've had a dog, had the dog for, I've, I've not had the dog too long, probably, probably six months. Um, that's just that's just absolutely fantastic. I love dogs, well, I love all animals. It's, it's, it's great to have, you know, um, a bit of companionship whenever, whenever you, like I said, you know, my, like, work, my wife works pretty unsociable at her, so I um, don't get to see her that often at times. Um, so that's, that's great. And, but they're also pretty similar in regards to just as, you know, whenever you're training the dog and whenever you're training the hockey, you think um, you're managing to get somewhere, you think you've cracked it, and then all of a sudden you realise, no, you didn't know, there's so much work still to do. And, um, but no, the dog's, the dog's family, so if I have to push them, I have to. Fair enough. Um, how do you deal with uh, the emotions when you, you lose a match that you were playing and that you feel like you deserve to win? Um, look, uh, that's, a, again, a pretty difficult uh, one. It doesn't really matter if you deserve to win it or not. The, you know, the emotions whenever you lose game, for me, are always pretty strong. Um, it's one of the it's one of the good things about playing tournament hockey and playing so many games with such a short, short space of time. You've often a game the next day or within two days to put it right. Um, it can be pretty difficult, but you just you have to try and use it as much as you can as a learning experience. And um, one thing I definitely will, will for any game you go and you look you review the game and you game individually as a team. And you try and work out how you can do better. Um, so that's that, that's one thing you just have to use it as motivation to try and get better the learning tools that where things went, went well but could have gone better and where things didn't go well and where you've got to put big improvements to make. Um then just try and use it as motivation. Would you rather fight one bear sized chicken or ten chicken-sized bears. Uh, um, oh, uh, I'm guessing it's probably ten chicken-sized bears would probably be the easiest, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, uh, but then you have to beat the 
made it campaign. So, um, well, probably if, if it's a smaller, it's probably easier to beat. Uh, that would be my understanding. Um, you probably can get as near to your or far back <laughs> Yes, one of our strangest questions that we've had. Um, does Will Callanan annoy you as much as it seems that he does on his Instagram stories? Absolutely. Um, I, I'm not on Instagram, so I actually don't get to see the stories, but I, I, I hear them and obviously he, he, he annoys the bag out of me. Um, but uh, he, he thinks it's a joke and I keep telling him, no, it's not a joke, it's real. Uh, Stop annoying me, but uh, apparently it's good. It's got great, got great reviews, and the boys, everyone else seems to enjoy him winding me up. But uh, no, he's a, he's a good lad. He's a, um, but uh, he likes to pick them what some of the most awkward moments to come and stick his phone in my face and pretend that we're best mates. Um, but. Uh, no, so far I haven't lashed out, but he, he, I've been close a couple of times. And what are your thoughts on his attempt at the your accent as well? <laughs> he does some very good accents, to be fair to him. Um, the actual Northern Irish accent, he's pretty good at, but my accent's a little bit different than, than the Belfast accent. Um, but uh, he likes to, and, and Will has played with a few Northern Irish, other Northern Irish players, like he watched Jeff McCabe at a club where I was serving at Hampstead. So he's picked up with quite a few sayings. So, no, to be fair to him, he's pretty good. What has been the most difficult time that you've been through in your hockey career? Um, there's obviously been quite a few with regards to, <laughs> I've had quite a few injuries and quite a few long term quite a few serious injuries but probably the most difficult was uh, Rio uh, the Rio Olympics um, we obviously went in there ranked fourth in the world at the time we had got sort of medal games of nearly every tournament we played in the previous four years so you know it was a really good team in my opinion um, but we just massively underperformed uh, what went wrong? Well, there's probably lots of little things rather than one big thing. And, uh, but that was that was a really difficult time because the well, Olympics is the dream, like I say, it's the biggest thing. We kind of never expected it to go as wrong as it, it, you know as it did. Um, and I think when you think back at that, the time. I was very embarrassed, um, ashamed of how, you know, how we played and how I played and how it went. Um, and that's not something you ever think about them in Olympic Games. You uh, kind of thought it's going to be the absolute pinnacle, it's going to be the best. We'd obviously make, tried to make sure that we peaked for that time. Um, and that, that was so disappointing. And I think part of the problem, well, not the problem, but one of the things we had quite a long break from hockey afterwards. Um, so part of the problem with that then is that's all you think about. Um, I wasn't then interested. I was, I was really down the dumps. Um, I think a lot of the guys were and, and staff were because that went so horrendously wrong for us. Um, you know, and I didn't want to I wasn't interested in going back playing hockey at once, but actually that was almost the worst thing for me because then all I did think about and that being, you know, separated is all you think about is how that went rather than focusing on what what's right in front of you and um, with that break was a bad time as well. And actually once I got back playing hockey, it was much better because they say you kind of not forget about what happened in Rio, but you, then when you get back into training and you get a goal or you're, you're trying to improve and you're in that moment just playing and you know forgetting about what happened in the past and just trying to improve and, that, and then obviously it came to a point where you want to make sure that what happened in Rio doesn't happen again and, uh, that you know, that's, that 
kind of going around in circles, but that, that was easily the, the toughest time. So we, we've talked there. We, uh, we've talked there about the, the toughest time, but then what is the best thing about being an international hockey player? What do you enjoy the most about your, your career? Um, well, like I said uh, earlier on, that, that feeling of, of just, that, I don't know how to describe it, probably pride is the best way to describe it. Um, but whenever you're standing with your teammates singing the national anthem just before, that minute, that, those few minutes just before an international hockey game are, are some of the best. Um, I'm playing with just a, a, a being part of a team, uh, being part of a team that's trying to push boundaries and, and, and improve and continually get better is pretty, can be, can be very frustrating at times, can be very annoying at times, but ultimately it can be very rewarding. It gives you um, it gives you a purpose and on how where you're trying to go, uh, and you know I, I like to I like to make sure I have a goal to work towards, and that, that's brilliant. The, obviously, the banter and the camaraderie of the team is is also, and that doesn't have to be an international team. That's on any team it can be is is part of the best thing about playing a team, a team sport. Um, like I, and to be honest, some of the best moments I have had are, 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 are you know, those moments straight after a big win, um, when you're in the changing room, boys are having a sing song, might be at the end of a tournament, usually at the end of a tournament, um, because that's another thing about playing tournament hockey earlier on. I said it was good if you have a bad week because you can you have a game the next often the next day, so you can rectify that, but. That's also the bad thing about playing in a hockey. If you have if you're playing a tournament and you have a really good result, often unless it's the last game of the tournament, you can't really enjoy it because you have a game to prepare for the next day. But that those games at the end of the tournament, whenever you won a medal or, or won the tournament, you know we won the Asan Shah in 2017 with, with Britain, um, and that was great. Um, beating Australia in the final. Well, beating Australia many times great as well. But beating in the final in a really, really good game um, was fantastic. And the celebrations after, like I said, those moments in the in the uh, the change room um, are extra special because they don't come around very often. And you know how hard you had to work to get there. Uh, we'll move on to the final two questions. Who is your first? Uh, who is your favourite? Sorry, person to room with when you're on tour. Oh, um, um, there are lots of pros and cons to a few, few different guys. Um, the first thing is you never want to share with the keeper because their cat stinks. Um, as much as as good as how much good they can be, value as part of people, um, they often get shoved in the bottom of the list because of their their kit. Um, Brendan Creed, to be fair, is a really really good roommate. Uh, um, um, he is as bipolar as they come, so can be an interesting character. Uh, um, uh, to, okay, to be honest, Anna, anyone who's neat and tidy gets on. <laughs> I get on very well with. I like to have make sure things are neat and tidy. Uh, but Phil Roper, we have we have good, a good good guy on track with Phil. Um, he often has uh, a bit of contraband uh, in his bag, which uh, obviously helps as a good roommate. Um, and then I spent a lot of my career sharing with Adam Dixon. Uh, I, yeah, most of the guys, to be fair, are, are pretty good. Uh, I shared with Alan Forsyth as well whenever I'm with her history in New Zealand. So having a kickback, someone like Helmick Panther is, is, um, is good. To be fair, most of them are pretty good. Uh, sorry, I sat in the fence really there, but... Um, no, we, we've got a few good answers there. Yeah. And final question is... Is an amalgamation of a few. We got a few questions in, um, specifically from Luke Taylor and Nick Banderak, um, about the size of your calves. So I won't ask the questions they asked, but at what point did uh, did your calves become so famous? Um, I don't really know. Um, 
they'd always been kind of famous growing up with whoever I played with. Um, but uh, I did, I did at the 2014 World Cup. Uh, I got sent a clip um, by a few different people, um, and one of the games, I don't know what game, that the commentator made comments about the size of my cast. So that probably put it into the wider hockey world that my calves are really pretty large. Um, but to be honest, uh, I don't. I, I get a lot of abu um, abuse about the size of my calves and about how useless they are. But as a number one runner, they're extremely useful and uh, they take a lot of uh, a batter and the balls. They're hard to get past. But to be honest, I don't even have the biggest calves in my family. Um, my dads are, are bigger than mine, and so with all my mates at home, it's more infatuation with the size of his calves um, rather than mine. Um, uh, I remember uh, one of the things I remember about my, my wedding is uh, turning around because I get here, my dad's one of my best friends, a guy called Chris Kirk, the infamous Chris Kirk. Um, was at the bar and all I heard was my dad turning around, would you get off me? Because I could see him at the bar pulling my dad's trouser legs up and saying, come on, Andy, would you give me a feel of those calves? <laughs> Which uh, uh, was, was quite comical. Um, so, yeah, um, I, yeah, like I said, my dad has bigger calves than me and like most people would probably ask about his mother than mine, but... Uh, they do have their uses at times. I couldn't think of a better way to end the show, to be honest. Uh, thank you so much, Gleggy, for, for joining us and being such a fantastic guest. No worries. Thank you very much. We'll be back with more Inside the Circle, the podcast, in two weeks. Subscribe to Inside the Circle, the podcast, now. And make sure you never miss an episode.